This video is brought to you by Raycon. So it's that time of year again, and in case you're out of holiday shopping ideas, then I'm going to once again recommend Raycon's Everyday E25 earbuds. Like I've said before, the E25s are the only wireless earbuds that I use and trust, and I'm certain they'll be great for just about anyone you know who enjoys quality sound, which is probably all of them. Use them while working from home, working out, taking phone calls, or my favorite, drowning out the outside world. Either way, with the E25s, you're in for six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design for a comfy, truly noise-isolating fit. The best part of this is that everyone could use a new pair of earbuds, so you don't have to sit around guessing what a certain friend or family member might want in a gift. Get the perfect present this holiday season for 20% off by heading on over to buyraycon.com slash rainbot. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash rainbot for 20% off, and with that said, let's begin. The first thing you have to understand about the Ricky McCormick case is that it's filled with contradicting information and varying versions of events. Even fundamental points regarding this case are unclear, and we'll get to why in a second. First though, let's talk about what we absolutely do know for certain. At the core of this story, obviously, is Ricky McCormick, a 41-year-old resident of St. Louis, Missouri, who found himself in a pretty unfavorable circumstance. Ricky was poor, suffering from health problems, and had run into legal trouble more than once in his life. On the surface, there really wasn't anything about Ricky that made him stick out, but on June 30th of 1999, the man would become the center of one of the FBI's greatest unsolved mysteries. This was because of the discovery of his body in a cornfield some 20 miles away from where he lived. Already there's a problem. First off, Ricky did not own a car and the area wasn't serviced by public transport. So how did he even get there? This was already strange in and of itself, but what was even more bizarre was the state of Ricky's remains. They were in an advanced state of decomposition despite both witness accounts and medical examinations, pointing to his death being only three days prior. And to make things even more complicated, said state of decay made it impossible for the manner and cause of death to be determined. There were no obvious injuries or items in the area that could explain how Ricky ended up there. but despite Despite this, the authorities were certain that what they had on their hands was a homicide. This in part because the area in which Ricky was found had a pretty hefty track record of being a criminal dumping ground. By all accounts, all trails ran cold. All aside from one, that is. The police did a standard search to see if Ricky had anything on him that might offer up a clue as to why he was out in the middle of nowhere, or maybe even point to who was responsible. And while they did find something incredibly interesting, what it means is still unclear. Within Ricky's pockets were two pieces of paper, both filled with seemingly random letters and punctuation that local police had no chance of being able to decipher. Before too long, the FBI's Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit, or CRRU, had stepped in. But then the unthinkable happened. The FBI, even with its vast experience and top expertise, couldn't crack the code. And that's basically the best law enforcement could do. No one has ever been charged with Ricky's murder, and by all accounts, authorities aren't even close to solving this case. Now, having said that, things may be at a legal standstill, but this definitely is not the end of the story. The police and FBI continued their efforts for another 10 years, and with results still managing to escape them, they decided to look elsewhere for assistance. In 2009, 10 years after Ricky's murder, both of his notes were presented to the American Cryptogram Association, which is apparently a thing and has been since 1930. The point is, they're probably the only other organization next to the FBI who could probably crack Ricky's code. But of course, they too found themselves stumped. This case would sit on the shelf for another two years after that, unfortunately still unsolved. And that's when the FBI finally broke and decided to ask the public for help deciphering the code. Now, I know we're probably all holding our breath here for some kind of lead to come through, but you're about to be in for more deja vu. Once again, no one could crack the code with any certainty, and that fact remains the same nearly a decade later. 
to this very day. The page about Ricky's notes remains live on FBI.gov. In it, Dan Olson, the head of the CRRU, says, We are really good at what we do, but we could use some help with this one. Breaking the code could reveal the victim's whereabouts before his death and could lead to the solution of a homicide. Not every cipher we get arrives at our door under those circumstances. Standard routes of cryptanalysis seem to have hit brick walls. Maybe someone with a fresh set of eyes might come up with a brilliant new idea. So at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that this case has been subject to scrutiny due to some inconsistent or contradicting information. Let's take a look at that along with what the internet seems to think is going on here. Some of you may be rightfully asking yourselves if Ricky really was murdered. One of the last times Ricky was seen alive was five days before his body was found, that being two days before his death. This, when he checked into a local ER complaining of issues related to his chronic heart and lung conditions. Now, even if Ricky didn't have a car, there's every possibility that he hitchhiked and simply had a heart attack. After all, the medical examiner couldn't identify how exactly the man died. With all of this in mind, it seems the FBI may be withholding information about the crime scene since they're dead set on this being a homicide. That of course wouldn't be too out of the ordinary since law enforcement does tend to keep certain info away from the press during ongoing cases, and on top of all of that, it seems highly unlikely that the FBI would waste over two decades at this point trying to solve this case if it wasn't in fact a crime. With all of that out of the way, we've arrived at the crux of this story. Did Ricky actually write the notes found in his pocket, and was he even capable of doing so? Keep in mind, these notes have stumped the entire world, including the people who helped crack codes in World War II. Was Ricky some kind of unknown genius who managed to fool even the world's best? Two massively important parties in this story clash on the answer. The FBI is dead set on this being Ricky's while Ricky's own mother says otherwise. But even that's complicated and here's why. In a New York Times article from 2011, Detective Michael Yarbrough, who worked directly on this case, told reporters, quote, McCormick's mother told investigators that her son had written in a secret language since he was a child, but that she had never understood it. A year later, a local paper called the Riverfront Times did a pretty extensive write-up on this case, and what was said there threw a wrench in the FBI's theories. According to Ricky's mother, the man was barely literate and intellectually disabled. Other relatives describe him as possibly suffering from mental illness, framing Ricky as being in his own world and prone to telling tall tales. They insisted that he couldn't have written the notes since all he could do was write his name, while the rest they described as scribbling. Now, this doesn't necessarily guarantee anything. Ricky's family might be convinced that he wasn't capable of writing the notes, but who knows what he might have been up to in private. I'm sure that every single one of us has either a diary or something similar that no one else has ever seen. It's impossible to actually know every single detail about someone, no matter how close you think you are. But regardless of that, there's something else about this that's just beyond perplexing. The Riverfront Times article continues and eventually reveals that Ricky's family was never notified by police or the FBI about the notes. They'd only learned about them after the 2011 public plea for assistance in solving them. According to Ricky's mother, she was told that he had nothing but emergency room tickets on his person at the time that his body was discovered. This of course wasn't unexpected given his health. So I'm sure you're as confused as I am right now. On the FBI's website about this case, they even mention needing, quote, another sample of McCormick's coded system or a similar one that might offer context. Again, this wording still implies that they're sure Ricky wrote the notes, but if so, then why did they never tell his family? Why not just ask them if they recognize the code? Again, a detective on the case told the New York Times that they did ask the family, and they did confirm that Ricky used code since he was a child, even. So which one is it? Is there somehow bad reporting involved in one of these parties, maybe even bad investigating on the part of law enforcement? Who knows? 
Looking back at the Riverfront Times write-up once more, Dan Olson, again the head of the FBI's CRRU, is confronted with Ricky's family's statements, but he decides to stick to his guns, stating, I have every confidence that Ricky wrote the notes. They are done in more of a format of something written to oneself than something written to someone else. Now, it should be noted that back in 2011, the FBI's website also mentioned Ricky's family saying that he wrote in code since he was a child, but that part has since been removed. Whether or not that's an admission of a mistake, I'll leave up to you. But for now, let's move on to some other points that people have made. Some people see the answer to this whole thing as being somewhere in between. For example, there are those who insist that Ricky did write the notes, but that it's actually just the ramblings of someone who was more than likely mentally ill, and therefore the notes are meaningless. Nothing more than random scribbling, like Ricky's mom said he was known for. That, of course, is a possibility, but again, dozens of people within the FBI and the American Cryptogram Association have looked this over, their consensus being that this isn't random. If you're wondering how they can tell, keep in mind, all of these people have been trained to weed out random combinations of letters and numbers. More than anyone, they can tell if something has intent behind it or not, and they all seem dead set on the idea that these notes are, in fact, solvable. Another perspective suggests that this might not be code at all, but perhaps a customized shorthand that Ricky pulled together, which again could be the so-called scribbling. And while this seems much more plausible, it seems like something the FBI or ACA would be able to pick up on. With that in mind, people have shifted to the possibility that maybe the notes are in fact code and solvable, but Ricky didn't write them. Some posit the theory that maybe the notes were planted by Ricky's attacker, but if so, why? Others say that maybe it wasn't Ricky and maybe it wasn't his attacker. But for this to make sense, we'll have to take a few steps back. In the weeks prior to his death, Ricky took a few trips to Florida and was suspected of trafficking illegal substances. Although many sources claim Ricky was unemployed, the Riverfront Times claims that he was employed at a gas station, one with a pair of owners who were known to be involved in a number of shady dealings. Some suspect that these two men may have been involved. After all, criminals of all types still use codes and ciphers to this very day in their correspondence. So maybe Ricky really was just a carrier who got caught. Towards the end of the Riverfront Times article, they claim there was a point in this investigation where an anonymous informant came into the picture. Whoever they were, they told local authorities that a well-known dealer and suspected murderer by the name of Gregory Knox was responsible for Ricky's death. But in the end, investigators couldn't pin the crime on any of the people I just mentioned. Gregory Knox, in jail by the time of the article's release, claimed that Ricky's story was new information to him and that he had no involvement in his death. Whether or not that's true, I have no idea, and unfortunately neither do the cops or the FBI for that matter. At the end of the day, we might never know who, if anyone, killed Ricky McCormick or what his notes actually say. That is, if they really are his notes and really can be solved. Today's video would not have been possible without the help of every single one of my supporters on Patreon, but especially these people. T. Gorman, Connor H., W. H., Zoe Chazales, KMBK Ketchup, Wayback Exploration, Ronnie, TBF, Salabarka, Michelle G., Guilty Pleasures, Corey Barks, David G., Catherine L., AJ Runaway, PD Gunn, Astro, Tyler T., Sean the CHB, Bloody the Elf, Andrew L., Esper Nix, Eric M., Brandon F., Daniel G., Ulysses, Lance, Layla R, Dave P, Chris R, Bath Time Duck, Mr. Gamer BBQ, Zimbledorf, the Calzone Consumer, Rye Sparrow, Tristan J, Francisco B, Jake J, Skygrinder, It's Mitt, Yellow for Jesus, Luck B, Scorian S, Benjamin M, Nick B, Melody, SPC, Zippo, Keith Z, Matt J, Jane, and Zarai. Again, everyone, thank you so much for listening, and I apologize for the audio in this whole thing. I've moved to a new recording area, and it's still very echoey. But anyway, I'll see you all soon.